not have a satisfactory scientific theory of consciousness. So when people are making claims like that, they're making claims off of their intuition or sort of making like very broad base claims off of their metaphysical claims. They're not saying, right? They're not saying that we have a firm scientific theory of consciousness and then I can reason from that and deduce that there's nothing that happens after we die. Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins and welcome to Life, Death and the Space Between. Today, I have an interview that I know is going to blow your mind because just reading this book, The World Between the World, blew my mind. Eric Howell is one of Forbes 30 Under 30 in Science and, and also a New York City Emerging Writers Fellow. Howell received his PhD in neuroscience at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and has been a postdoctoral researcher at Columbia University, a visiting scholar at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and a research professor at Tufts University. His new book, The World Behind the World, is out now, and we are going to delve into consciousness, neuroscience, and the overwhelming limits of science in general. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Uh, I feel like I was back in school reading this book, and now I'm going to get a personal kind of mentorship from the professor. So I get to ask all my questions directly to you. So welcome, Eric. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And I'm so glad that you got a kick out of the book. Um, it was it was quite an experience to write. Um, and it summed up a lot of my thinking for the past 10, 20 years, um, as long as essentially I've been a scientist. So let's start with, with, I have two questions, is the first is how you started and got into researching the concept of consciousness. Let's start there. And then I want to have a working definition of consciousness. So we're all kind of working off out of the same kind of mindset when we're talking about this today. Sure. Um, and I think it might be easier for, easiest if I just flip those two. Okay. So in terms of the, in terms of a definition, in general, the, the field of scientific research into consciousness has broadly agreed on the definition of consciousness as your stream of experience um, that begins when you wake up from a deep dreamless sleep. It is sort of you for the whole day, and then it vanishes when you go under a deep dream into a deep dreamless sleep again, or under anesthesia. Um, your consciousness is what it is like to be you. It's this subjective, um, um, you know, William James called it a stream. It's a subjective stream that essentially occupies your, your every waking moment. And you, most people uh, can introspect and say that most of their actions, behaviors, uh, and thoughts are all sort of based off of their consciousness, right? You think, oh, I'm, I'm feeling thirsty, and so I'm going to go get a glass of water. And this very obvious thing, this stream of consciousness that we're all very familiar with, one that we think of not only ourselves having, but other people having that we think of our, our pets and, and animals as having, right? We think of our, of our, of, of a dog as having a stream of consciousness. This very basic notion was the early target for psychologists and neuroscientists. If you go back and you look historically, but there was a period of time in the 20th century wherein consciousness just became a verboten subject in science. This is due to the rise of a couple different, almost metaphysical conceptions. This would be things like, um, you know, the, the rise of materialism as a metaphysical position, the rise of, um, of scientific pragmatism. Um, there, there's sort of a, a general um, more, more shift towards reductionist material explanations. And it makes a great deal of sense historically in some ways, because physics was making so much progress by essentially running you know, with those views. But at the same time, this meant that the main target for neuroscience and psychology, which is to explain how the brain generates a stream of consciousness, was was pushed to the side. And it wasn't even really allowed to be researched um, until effectively two, two Nobel Prize winners, one of which was Francis Crick, who was the co-discoverer of DNA, who's, who's quite famous as a scientist, and the other, uh, Jerry Edelman, 
uh, who is probably less less famous, but um, he won the Nobel Prize for essentially discovering how the immune system functions. Mm. And the weight of these Nobel Prizes, both these winners looked around and said, what are the open scientific problems? And they said, well, we don't have a theory of consciousness yet. In fact, almost no one seems to be talking about it. So they founded this field of neuroscientific research into consciousness in effectively the 80s and 90s. And by the early 2000s, when I was becoming a scientist, it had grown enough to be a legitimate uh, field that you could actually go out and get your PhD in, right? So you could go and you could you could get your PhD uh, searching for essentially a neuroscientific theory of consciousness. Um, and it's still a smaller, less popular part of neuroscience, which is quite surprising because most people, they just think naively that, of course, neuroscientists would be the most interested in how it is that the brain generates, you know, the stream of consciousness that is sort of the main the, the main part of you existing, right? But actually it's a very small field. So I was very, I was, I was very lucky to come in at the right historical time. Um, and it couldn't have happened like tw even 20 or 30 years ago. I never could have say gotten a PhD and been able to openly talk about consciousness. It was something you could only do if you already had a Nobel prize. So let me, let me ask this. Cause you said consciousness as, as you define it exists from when we wake up to when we go to bed. So what happens after that in the in the in our sleep state what is that experience considered yeah so i i think i think it's it's important to distinguish between uh the deep dreamless part of sleep and you know people used to sort of say that this was non-rem uh now there's some evidence that you can actually dream during non-rem to some degree and so on so these these sleep stages aren't as maybe cleanly distinguished as as we thought but effectively there's still it's still the case that you go through various stages as you sleep and you sort of go deeper into sleep and at at many points of sleep if you wake people up and you ask them you know what was going on they'll say nothing there was absolutely nothing going on right like i i effectively did not exist right mm -hmm. and that is a, a true loss of consciousness mm -hmm. but other times they'll report dreams um, and we actually know that dreams are very common much more common than just your recollection you do dream effectively all night um you know on and off and we know this because of sudden wake-up experiments where you get some poor participant in a right, lab who and up you wake them up all of a sudden and you ask them, what were you, what was going on? You know? And they're like, Oh, I was surrounded by, you know, monkeys playing tambourines or, or whatever. And, uh, and, 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 and I think, you know, dreaming certainly counts as, as possessing consciousness, but it's, it's not as, you know, vivid. It's not as distinct. Mm. It's, 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 uh, difficult to remember and so on, but I would certainly consider dreaming as, um, as, as being conscious or having a stream of consciousness. So can you explain the intrinsic perspective and the extrinsic perspective that kind of, it seems like are, are at odds a little bit when trying to understand consciousness? Yeah, a big, a big part of this book was taking the framings and ideas from scientific research into consciousness and sort of thinking about them more historically, more at a really grand, almost civilizational level, right? So in the, in the first part of the book, I tell the story of the development of what I think are essentially two very distinct perspectives on the universe at large. Uh, and I argue that a big part of our, what would be called our progress as a civilization is that we're much better at taking these perspectives and representing them. And the, the two sort of main ones are the extrinsic perspective, which almost everyone is familiar with. If you've, you know, it's, it's a perspective of physics. It's the perspective of mechanism. When you describe how a car engine works, you're speaking extrinsically as like a causal model of the parts of the car interacting. Um, and then there's also the intrinsic perspective. And the intrinsic perspective is what you use when you talk about a, other minds and your own mind, um, and not just in terms of their behavior, but but everything about what it is like to be uh, to be a person. And we all know that the extrinsic perspective developed historically, and that we got better and better at talking about the universe and physics. Um, and it, you know, we, we, there's a very sort of classic tale that where it begins in ancient Greece, and it sort of you know peaks. And then it sort of goes away for a little bit during the dark ages. And then it sort of peaks again, um, you know, in, in the enlightenment. And 
And, and that story is sort of well told, but I wanted to tell the story of the intrinsic perspective, which is talking about peop, uh, how we understand minds. Mm -hmm. And I'm essentially arguing that we did something very similar to just like how science sort of refined our extrinsic notion of the world. Um, literature and art have really refined our intrinsic notions of the world, our ability to talk about and represent consciousness to sort of explore its depths. Um, and one of the things I do in the book is sort of compare ancient literature to modern literature. And you'll notice if you go back and you read ancient literature, and of course, you always have to account for translation and all these other things. But, uh, you know, people would not had had almost no interest in describing what the the experiences of the people undergoing them right it'll be like mm -hmm. you know um a, 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 so, someone met like a monster in a tail and they don't even have an emotional reaction to it they just like talk to the beast um mm -hmm. and then you know versus like if you go and you read ulysses by james joyce um you know almost everything is all about the consciousness and the experience um, and so on. So, so I think we, we, we sort of have gotten very good as, as a civilization at representing these things. And I, I use that as a frame because, of course, neuroscience is where the extrinsic meets the intrinsic. So in other words, we, we sort of have these two very well-developed perspectives. But then there's this further question of, well, how do, you, how do you reconcile them? How is it that the brain, which is extrinsic, essentially just, you know, I mean, you could, you'd almost say but like little bits of algae puffing chemicals at one another, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's what your brain really sort of is, right? About and reductionistic, that, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, it's very reductionist, but that's certainly, right, that the, the extrinsic account of it. And then there's also this intrinsic account where we can talk about emotions and feelings and thoughts and so on. And then the question is, well, how do you reconcile them? And I think that that's sort of the main job of neuroscience. Um, and then in a way, it's, it's sort of this final reconciliation of these two perspectives that we've been developing as a global civilization of getting better and better at talking about these two things. So how do we reconcile it? I mean, you, you said in the book, I love this quote, had Galileo traveled in time to the present to hear that we, have having, that we are having a difficult time, we are having difficulty giving a physical explanation of consciousness, he would likely respond with, of course you are. I designed physical science to deal with qualities, not quantities. No, with quantities, not qualities. He might have said science works great as long as it doesn't directly study souls, things that are beyond science, the purview of culture and religion. Yeah, and, and I and I think that that's exactly what he would say. Right? He was he was he was a religion. We, we think of Galileo as this great sort of you know arguer for 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 science, and he was, but he was also you know a very religious man. Um, and um, and and I think that you're 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 right to point out that that's exactly the demarcation where science says let's just deal with the extrinsic forget mm -hmm. the intrinsic for a moment this seems almost too hard to explain let's just push it back you can almost view it as a form of bracketing right you sort of have bracketed aside this part of the universe and said let's not look at that for right now let's just proceed as if you know everything is just fundamental forces or mm -hmm. um you know billiard balls and that was an immensely successful strategy. I mean, I, I, there's just, is just inarguable that that was a brilliant strategy. Um, and, it, and having sort of a faith that that view would be um, complete is, I think, a part of the success of science. But part of the reason for science's success is sort of that, is sort of this faith that we're going to get these billiard level, billiard ball level explanations for every ph ph phenomenon out there. But the problem is, is that neuroscience doesn't have the option to ignore it. Right. And isn't there, it, it seems to me quite dismissive. You know, my podcast is about exploring what happens when we die and does our consciousness go exist beyond the physical body. And I think we're very quick to say, no, science hasn't proven that it does. So it doesn't. And it sounds to me a bit like you, what you're saying here is we haven't perhaps explored it enough to know that science can't explain it because we haven't dug into it enough. Yeah, so I, I, when it comes to, so there's sort of, you know, 
multiple multiple threads here. I think at a very high meta meta level, um, I think it would be very surprising. And, and this is how I like to frame it to sort of get people sort of sort of from, from the perspective of maybe some skepticism about about science uh, as a whole, mm -hmm. right? And that would just be that it would be quite surprising if every single scientific fact that you feel sort of should be answerable through science actually was answerable. Mm. Like it, it would be, it would be quite, um, it would be quite a good, a good universe to live in, in some ways, right? You, you would think, okay, this is, this is incredibly like, what a coincidence, right? We, we, we have this methodology and we can sort of apply it and eventually it will literally reveal everything, everything all right, knowledge, right? right. And, and, and that's, and when you frame it like that, um, I, I think already, you know, you can, you can, you, you, you can see, okay, well, maybe, maybe not though. I can certainly imagine the case that it wouldn't be. And then you can compare science and make an analogy. And that analogy is to the sort of the queen of sciences, which is mathematics. And mathematics is in some ways much more beautiful, elegant, and axiomatic than, than science is, mm -hmm. right? We always think of mathematical truths as being in some ways more fundamental than scientific truths, which is why, you know, when someone says two plus two equals five, you know, everyone says, no, 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 it's, it's sort of obvious or axiomatic. The problem is, is that we know from research, you know, again, sort of these questions were being struggled with in the, in the, in the 20th century, uh, we know that mathematics is not actually complete. It's fundamentally incomplete. And so what that means is that there are sort of uh, statements or, 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 or you can just be broader and say, and say, I, I, ideas that, that seem like they should be statable in the language of mathematics. Um, and yet, which lead to paradox. And you can, you can try to sort of bracket aside the paradox, right? There's various ways to do that, but it's very, very difficult to get rid of. And so then when you take those two things and you combine them and you make this analogy and you say, okay, well, if, if even mathematics has, you know, a fundamental incompleteness to it, it doesn't now seem at all unreasonable to think that maybe some aspects of science would be very, uh, would be like maybe literally inaccessible to us. And as a, as a very simple example, because this does pertain to this question of, 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 of consciousness, is that um, most of the paradoxes, for example, in mathematics or paradoxes in general, like the statement, you know, I am lying right now, right? Well, if I'm lying right now, I'm telling the truth, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm telling the <laughs> truth, then I'm lying, right? right? right. You, it's just, there's just a paradoxical statement. And it's a paradoxical statement because it's, it's self-referential because I am is really saying this sentence is lying right now, right? So it's really um, a self-reference. Mm -hmm. And so it would be very, so if, if it were to be the case that science were incomplete, it would be very unsurprising to find out that the place where science struggles the most is when it, where there's self-reference. Uh, and that's precisely what, you know, seems to be going on with this difficulty of neuroscience to really produce something that's satisfactory when it comes to a theory of consciousness. And then if that's the case, then I do think that, um, you know, I, I actually do have a part of the book where I talk about it. Let, let's just assume that that is sort of true, that this paradoxical thing is true. What does it suggest? And I think you know, I can't help but being a bit of a, of a skeptic and saying, I don't know if it suggests anything in particular. Mm. So it's, it's sort of like, there's this unknowability, mm. but I can't, you know, then go and say, well, let me, you know, suggest some particular religion or some particular idea out of that. It's more just this fundamental uncertainty that you're forced to just sort of live in a universe where you, you can't actually drive all the facts that you would want to drive right. about it. Yeah. And and do you think that the quest like the quest for knowing is a defense against the inability to sit with uncertainty in this way? Like that perhaps there are just things we might that's never a, that's know. That's a really interesting question. I, I I do think in fact I wrote, you know, before before I wrote this book, I wrote um a novel called The Revelations and and it, it's really about unsolvable mysteries. Um, and, and, and I do think that there's something fundamental about how you, 
how you orientate yourself to mystery is sort of how you live your life, right? Because right. We're, we're these very limited creatures. Um, and, and, but, but, but I also think that there are some mysteries that are almost like, um, they're not, it's, it's, they're almost like a Lovecraftian horror in the fact that you can't get an angle on them. You don't even know if it's actually a Lovecraftian horror or cosmic horror. You don't know if it's, it's something beautiful. It's just totally inaccessible. Um, and, um, and, and, and I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to sort of suggest that science is like this versus say to, to prove it. But I think that this notion of scientific incompleteness um, and that consciousness sort of being a very good model of an example of something that's fundamentally complete um, is, um, is, 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 is very possibly true. And by the way, this isn't um, like deep metaphysical talk. Like there's already <laughs> good evidence that there are properties in science that are just, in, particularly within physics, that are just like essentially undecidable. There's no general way to decide them. Okay. So an example of this would be the spectral gap, which is some particular physical quantity that oh my God, um, this is like, physicists whoa. actually care about. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in 2000, the point is you don't need to know exactly what it is, but the point is that it's basically just this physical quantity that physicists are interested in, but it was proven in 2015 in a nature paper that it's fundamentally undecidable. Got so it. okay. we, we literally already have examples of things in science, but they're just sort of stuff that people are sort of like, well, whatever. Right, like right? that doesn't it's, it's, make it's exactly the same way that in the same way the death affects me. Right, exactly. So, so it's sort of like... You know, for, I, I don't know how people make this decision about like what results like shake their worldview, right? But you know, that's obviously somehow not enough to to shake people's worldview. That's like that's like an acceptable level of undecidability right, or right. something. Um, and then, but but I, you know, I think it's very possible that there could be much sort of more relevant things uh, that are that are undecidable. And I don't think it's unreasonable to say that consciousness might be one of them just because of the self-referential way that science is set up. So where are things right now in terms of, of your neuroscience understanding consciousness? Like where, where are we at this point? You know, what was interesting, you talked about mirror neurons in the, um, in the book. And I remember, I think it was like around 2000. Was that when mirror neurons or was it earlier than that? That's around right. two, no, it was around. Yeah, because right. I remember Dan Siegel, who was one of the people who was really, I think, at maybe some of the forefront, or really kind of moving into integrating mirror neurons into the psychological work he was doing. Um, kind of came to the forefront, and then you said it's like it's gone dormant. <laughs> um, people aren't talking as much about yeah. neurons. <laughs> um, so where does that leave us? Where does this leave us now? You know, a big thing has been neuroplasticity of the brain or of the of the brain, of the mind? What do we say? Of the, or, I guess both in some ways. Um, that, that we used to think that there was only a capacity for it to continue to expand. And now we know that that's likely not the case, that it can expand into adulthood. And, you know, now we're using psychedelic substances to help with expansion and connection of neurons and synapses and all of that. But where are we right now in terms of, of consciousness? That's actually a very good like bird's eye question because I think I think we're in a very interesting place, um, which is that finally for the first time we don't have a consciousness winter in that we can actually talk about consciousness uh, within neuroscience. And as I said, there's a, you know you can go to the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness, which is hosted every year, and meet like a thousand other neuroscientists, you know, who are all interested in talking about consciousness. I just can't imagine the level of conversation at that event. Like it's got to. I think I would understand like one tenth, oh, one one millionth event. of what was being said. Well, I think it, in some ways, you know, maybe much more than that, because I think the other thing to say about it is that the the there is no leading uh scientific theory of consciousness and i think that's both mm -hmm. obviously sort of a problem for the subfield but of course the goal of the subfield is to produce one but it's also a problem much broader problem for for neuroscience as a whole um i make the argument in the book that neuroscience as a science is um as 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 Kuhn, who was a very famous philosopher of science, would say, it's pre-paradigmatic. 
So there's no overarching paradigm for neuroscientists to fit their results into. And to give an example of this, you know, if there was there was biology before Darwin, right? There were people who were biologists, right? But they didn't have the theory of evolution by natural selection. And so the field wasn't really cohesive. It was sort of these boom and bust myths. And that's the very similar to the situation we see in neuroscience today, where, for example, as you said, you had this big thing where everyone's talking about mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are going to explain everything. And now the mirror neuron has sort of collapsed into confusion. It's not clear what counts as a mirror neuron. It's not clear what these mirror neurons are supposedly doing. It's not clear that they're anything special about humans. It's sort of just complexified to the point of, of nothingness. And, um, and I think that that's a very common story within neuroscience, if you look at the individual parts of it. And I think probably the big reason why is that there's no uh, big paradigm for, th for, for, every, for, for results to fit into. And the reason there's no big paradigm is because, well, what is the function of the brain? What is this organ doing? It is generating a stream of consciousness. That is its job every day. That's the main thing it does. The brain. Yeah, it's it's it's. So where does yeah, the mind it's, it's dynamically... fit into that? Well, I think I think you could you know when I say the term generating, um, I think you could replace it with a bunch of different terms depending on what your your theory of the, the mind body relationship actually ends up being. So an example is maybe the brain is correlated to mental states. Maybe the, maybe there's interactive dualism, who knows, maybe the brain is responsive to mental states. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I use the term generating there. I think you're right. You're right to say that. Well, wait a minute, that might be like a very particular claim. Um, but, but my point is that, you know, in the end, the brain is an organ. A better way to say it is that its main job is, is, a stream of consciousness, right? Like it's, 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 you know, it's sort of like Ken and, you know, it's like, well, yeah, I, I, what's your job, right? Is one word, right? It's just, what's the job of the brain? Consciousness, right? right? Ken's job is just beach, <laughs> right. right? It's like, that's what the brain does. It, 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 consciousness <laughs> is the point, right? And, um, and, and, and that means that we're trying to understand an organ. Well, not really talking about like the main thing that it, that it does and so it's, I think it's very reasonable just from that very meta perspective to make the claim that neuroscience is probably pre-paradigmatic and that you should be very careful about really seriously taking very seriously the claims that come out of neuroscience. I think you can, mm. you can, you know, you, you, you can take them seriously, you know, to a certain degree, but I wouldn't say, you know, just because you heard about some new, you know, discovery or new thing like mirror neurons that are, you know, supposedly going to explain all of human civilization, well, that didn't end up happening. And that's true for, for a lot of stuff that comes out of neuroscience. So how do you explain or how would you explain or understand mediumship um, or these near death experiences that people report. And maybe those are two very different things. Yeah. Um, so, so like, like it's a, it's a good, it's, I think it's a very fair question given the actual um, content and implications of the book to, to, to be, to be totally honest. Right. It's, it's a very, very fair question. I myself personally am a very skeptical person. So you can you can find I write online as well. I'm a, I'm a bit of a blogger. So like I just wrote a big recent piece about UFOs and like mm. why I don't you know why I don't really lend too much credence to you know a lot of the contemporary UFO reports, and it's because I'm sort of you know skeptical by 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 nature. Um, at the same time, you know as I said, like I'm a, I'm a fiction author. I'm a writer, right? So I don't I don't think that um, you know when I when I look at science. It, it it strikes me in two ways. It flips between seeming seeming almost so powerful and so you you know acidic. I I think um, it was Dan Daniel Dennett who called the theory of evolution by natural selection a universal acid. Uh, mm. But but there's this a, a, a where it just sort of reduces away meaning. And there's a sense in which science itself sometimes looks like that to me, um, where it's just this totalizing thing. Um, and then there's other times where, where science looks almost like childish to me. Like, obviously, like, obviously we're not going to figure everything out. Like, what are you, what are you people Right. Doing? I mean, you said um, you got into science because you thought the universe was knowable. Yeah. And, and I said at the end of an education, I think the universe is probably uh -huh. unknowable, but I think where, where, where I'm, where I probably 
where I probably differ or, or, or can, can bring a bit of a unique perspective here is that I'm sort of, I'm sort of skeptical about the other side too. Right. Mm. So, um, you know, the, mo the moment, and I think it's really important for me, and this has been, there's a sense in which the skepticism that I would, uh, you know, espouse for, for, for sort of most slightly one, one could use the term pseudoscientific claims, you know, I'm not going to use that term, but like for that sort of stuff, my skepticism is also in a way self-protective because if you're someone who researches consciousness for a living, consciousness is already like a very weird subject right. that most scientists like don't want to talk about. Right. So if I, if I go out and I start talking about, you know, near death experiences or, or, um, you know, what, 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 what this means in terms of, you know, for, for, for the soul or something like that, um, I get in trouble. I would get in trouble very, very quickly. And and, and and so that's just a sort of preface. Maybe that's where the problem lies is like, why can't we put these two things together to try to really deeply understand them? Like, what is so scary about that for people? <laughs> well, I think, I think already consciousness is so scary because, specifically because the solution to it doesn't seem to look like any other scientific theory. So this is very classically known. So let's say that I have a good theory of consciousness wherein, you know, I know that if a part of your brain sort of lights up in terms of activity, you're experiencing red. And if a part of your brain lights up, you know, an activity, you're experiencing the sound of a trumpet and so on. Um, and then I can sort of ask this further question of like, well, why would there be any accompanying experience at all? Why doesn't it just extrinsically, like I said, the little bits of the little plants, the little bits right. of algae puff chemicals at one another. Why doesn't that all go on in the dark without any mm -hmm. subjective experience occurring? And that seems very imaginable. There's a bunch of sort of philosophical arguments that work off of this intuition, but it's an intuition that I think if people are honest about, um, most will feel where it's like, well, okay, you can give me this sort of neural extrinsic explanation, but you're not really giving me what I want to know about, which is this, this intrinsic stuff. Mm -hmm. Where does that, where is that coming from? By what rules is that being created? And you know, science is very good at talking about the extrinsic. So then you sort of can stack on more and more extrinsic, uh, you know, extrinsic parts of your explanation, but it never really seems to get you over to the intrinsic stuff that wants to be explained. And so in that, uh, a, a scientific theory of consciousness already looks a bit different or quite different than something like a physical theory. In fact, we don't even know mm. precisely what it would, what it would look like. It's, it's, it's basically, it's sort of easy to imagine a theory, even like a theory of everything, right? Which is some equation you can write down on a t-shirt and that this is like the fundamental equation. Every physicist can sort of imagine that to be the case, but it's very hard to sort of imagine, well, exactly what would a satisfactory theory of consciousness be? And so that's what I mean by consciousness is already very weird. So I think part of the reason mm. why people, uh, shy away from these subjects uh, is particularly sort of within the standard scientific community is just essentially that it seems so hard as to be almost unsolvable. And then it sort of implies some things about science itself. And I think that that's where people, they, they, they notice that and they become, become, become in, in fundamentally implicitly wary. Um, at least that's, that's what I found. And so with, then when you combine that, you know, with, with everything else, right. Which is that science, science tries very hard to sort of defend its borders about what is science and what isn't science and so on. Um, when you sort of combine all those things, it makes for like a very, a very like match match stick environment, I think intellectually. Um, and that's why most of the people who are in consciousness research, you will not hear them speculate about anything spiritual or religious or so on, unless you, you know, get them a couple beers in at a bar and then, you know, you can, you can, you can talk. To so them does that it. mean you haven't had beers yet at noon, one o'clock your time? <laughs> well, it's Friday. Means, it's yeah. Friday. It's, it's Friday. <laughs> I, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's definitely possible. I'm working from home. Okay. So. Well, maybe call me back in like three hours and then I can ask you my, yeah, there my you go. last <laughs> question, which is, what do you think happens when we die? Which you just told me you're not going to speculate on because you you haven't had enough drinks yeah. yet. So if, if I if, if, I, if I, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll, then I'll just be as honest as possible and answer more as it take my you know scientist hat and 
answer from my human being hat. Um, to be honest, I think probably nothing. Mm. I think probably nothing. But, but so, I will say sorry, this. Sorry, listeners. Right? We, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. You just sorry, busted yeah, the whole sorry, premise of my whole five years of podcasting. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but let me, let me be like very fair here. That is not a scientifically proven fact simply because what people usually are mean are they're referring to something specific, which is the continuation of a stream of consciousness. And we do not have a satisfactory scientific mm. theory of consciousness. So when people are making claims like that, they're making claims off of their intuition or sort of making like very broad base claims off of their metaphysical claims. They're not saying, right, they're not saying that we have a firm scientific theory of consciousness and then I can reason from that and deduce that there's nothing that happens after we die. That's way too strong. So I will absolutely say that, that, that if, if someone makes that claim, they're making a claim that's way too strong. I think they can make like weaker claims about sort of, you know, very broad stuff about intuitions or like they have very broad medical metaphysical views like materialism. And then they say, well, that just sort of has to apply regardless of what a theory looks like. But, um, but I will say that there's, if, if, if someone is saying that they're making that argument from we know exactly what consciousness is and we can track exactly when it begins and ends and so on, well, we can't. We, we can't do that. We're waiting for some theory uh, that tells us. And who knows? Maybe the theory will be very strange. You know, uh, you know people always talk about maybe there's some relationship between consciousness and quantum physics. Mm -hmm. I think probably not. But as I've looked more into the accounts and so on. I don't think it's, I don't think it's, um, it's totally out of the question. I think that there should be some people who are looking into that and saying, okay, well, maybe, maybe observers do collapse the wave function and maybe we can sort of reconfigure aspects of quantum physics to account for consciousness. There is some interesting academic work on that. That's not crazy or, you know, people will dismiss it as like totally crazy or out there. I think it's not very firm, you know, it's right. not very like super well supported or anything empirically, but it's, it's absolutely not crazy. So, you know, I, I would say in, in the end, I'm sort of an agnostic, you know, I, I, I lean one way where I'm naturally a skeptic, but like in the end, I think I'm fundamentally an agnostic about, about the universe mm. as a whole. And so in that to be an agnostic is to be fundamentally open. So, so to quote, probably like the smartest thing I'm going to say today to quote dumb and dumber. <laughs> Did you ever see Dumb and Dumber? <laughs> I, I, I did see Dumb and Dumber. It's been a little while. So you're saying but there's a chance. Brain. There's a couple neurons. Right. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, when, when yeah. she basically like totally dismisses everything about him, but then there was like a little bit of hope. And, she, and I don't remember if it was Jim Carrey or Jeff Daniels. And he looks at her and goes, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> yeah yeah precisely i mean that's a that's a real i i think that is a real serious thing to to say i think it's a very defensible position if one does say it and that would be an example of just saying listen science isn't over <laughs> science is not over you know and and plenty of very smart people so for example I, I quote stephen hawking in the book everyone knows stephen hawking from you know most of his work they don't know many of his later stances which he argued something very similar to scientific incompleteness where he mm. said we probably won't ever discover a theory of everything and he would he became skeptical as he aged mm. um and so that's an example of like you know St stephen hawking is a very very smart person and he has you know fundamentally somewhat agnostic beliefs about about the possibility of knowledge um and then that that does sort of leave the door open. So for at least the universe being much weirder than we, you know, currently conceptualize it as, you know, billiard ball or something. Like maybe it's maybe it's very, very strange. Um, I think we'll just our, our grandkids will just have to <laughs> find right, out. <laughs> right. I mean, your your son sounds like he's already well on his way of figuring this out. But what I think is is so fascinating here is that and I think what you go back to is that, you know, you said that the universe is likely unknowable. And in that, I feel like, in that mysticism and in that magic is really an exciting place to live because we probably don't know and we might never know. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly can't, art, you know, if to, to me, it's sort of like I'm torn between the two views, the positive and the, the negative when it comes to that. Uh, but you're right. I think, I think it's, it's sort of like what you then make of it. Right. Right. Um, how you orientate yourself to it. 
Well, Eric, if people are interested in your fascinating work, this was such a fun conversation. Where where can they find it? Yeah, so if you if you just type in the world behind the world, uh, that's the book we're discussing. That'll crop up on on Amazon. Um, they did such a good job with the cover. Um, and then I also write very regularly. I, r- I run a Substack called The Intrinsic Perspective um, for a bunch of subscribers, and they, it, we, I post essentially every week um, essays about all sorts of stuff. So. Well, thank you so much for this incredibly fascinating conversation and for the work that you're doing on a really really important topic for us all to grapple with and try to figure out and understand and sort through. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me on. It was, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Wondering what comes next and what it all means? Head over to Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. Also, if you could take a minute to rate and review my podcast, I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned as we continue to explore life, death, and the space between.